Welcome to the JAMS Virtual Sake Tasting Fundraising Event sponsored by the Council General of Japan in San Francisco, Ozeki Sake, Takara Sake, and the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. I'm Michael Serra, the JAMS Board President, standing in front of the museum. Today's event is intended to help strengthen the Japan-US economic relations through a community-based event. We're hoping to have this event live this year, but with the Omicron variant, weather uncertainty, we decided to pivot to a virtual event. Our hope is that when you are comfortable venturing out, you'll come visit San Jose Japantown, the museum, all the great shops and restaurants we have here. We will start the event by taking a quick tour through JAMS to discuss the history of agriculture and the significance it played. We'll then take a quick drive down to Hollister to meet with the team at Ozeki Sake. They will share their history, why they decided to locate in Hollister, and how they make their wonderful sake. They'll then take us through the tasting of their sake, so get your Ozeki Sake bottles and several glasses ready. But before we start, I would like to give a big warm welcome to Council General Kawamura, who will kick off the event. Good evening, everyone. First, I would like to extend my appreciation to the Japanese American Museum of San Jose for helping to organize this exciting event as well as Ozeki and Takara Sake for their generous sponsorship. I would also like to thank the entire San Jose Japan Town community for your dedicated commitment to preserving and sharing Japanese American history, culture, and cuisine. Tonight's event would not be possible without you. It is unfortunate that we must gather virtually at this time, in light of the ongoing pandemic. However, it warms my heart to see that so many people are interested in knowing more about Japanese food and drink culture. Tonight's event is a great opportunity to learn how sake, Japanese American history, and Japan town intertwine. Sake has a long and storied history in Japan and also continues to grow in international popularity. In fact, alcoholic beverages, including sake, are now the number one agricultural export from Japan to the United States. The total export value has more than tripled from just 10 years ago. In addition to sake brewed in Japan, there are many producers right here in Northern California, including Ozeki and Takara Sake. Additionally, it is now possible to find sake at many different types of retail stores and restaurants, serving different types of cuisine. I think it is safe to say we will continue to see new combinations of sake and international cuisine, like sake served alongside pasta, steak, and even cheese platters. And I look forward to the new relationship this will help to create. I hope today's sake tasting will be a fun and educational experience for all. Thank you. Council General Kawamura, thank you very much for your kind words and for helping us kick off the event. We're going to now run to the back of the museum, so hold on. Here we are back in the agriculture area of the museum. We have 2,400 square feet of farm equipment. More than 90% of this was donated to the museum by the Sakoe family, specifically Eichi Sakoe, one of our founding members in the museum. During the peak back in the 1940s, the Japanese and Japanese Americans were a small percentage of the population, but they were a major player in the agriculture and farming business. As we all know, this area is great for growing many things, including rice, along with a great source of water from the Sierra Nevada, especially this year. This is also a fundraiser to help us restore a piece of history that resides on the Jams property. We refer to it as the Kawakami House. 
Thanks to financial support like yours, we'll be able to start the restoration of a Kawakami house this year. This home represents the struggles and tenacity of the Japanese Americans as their family members were incarcerated at Park Mountain Wyoming War Relocation Authority, were represented in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, and became naturalized citizens after years of living in the United States. The house is a humbling symbol of our immigration experience and appreciation for our past generations. We hope to bring life back into this house and provide new opportunities of building bridges of understanding through inspiration, innovation, and inclusion. We're now going to take a quick drive down to Hollister and connect with Ozeki Sake. So here we go! We made it! I'd like to now introduce Yuki Nishimura, a JAMS volunteer and a part of the team that helped put this event together. She'll take it from here and introduce the Ozeki team. Yuki, take it away! Thank you so much, Michael, and welcome again to everybody here joining us today. I hope that you are all just as excited as I am to learn more about Ozeki Sake. And I hope that you have your sake bottles prepared because we will be transitioning straight to the, trans, um, the tasting portion right after we hear a little bit about the history. Also, just to prepare ahead of time, please have your cups ready and your snack boxes. I believe it came in these purple bags that Linda had prepared for all of you. So please have those ready as well. Today, I am really thrilled to be welcoming Asa Imasa and Mark Fukushima-san from Ozeki Sake. Asa-san is a sales representative at Ozeki and has been there for three years. She's based in LA and has a WSET3 sake sommelier. And Mark Fukushima-san is a sales and marketing manager from Ozeki and has been there for nine years. He's also based in LA and also has a WSET3 sake sommelier. So without further ado, I would love to pass it off to Asa-san, who will be sharing with us about the history of Ozeki Sake and its journey over to the U.S. Asa-san, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you, yuki -san, for the introduction. I'm Azusa, and I'm a sales rep for Ozeki Sake. Thank you for having us here today, and I'm really excited to do this Japanese American Museum San Jose virtual sake tasting with you all today. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So um, first, uh, I will be talking about Ozeki Sake in our breweries, then a brief lesson on what is sake. And then finally, we'll be doing some sake tastings and food, food pairings with you guys. So let's get started about Ozeki Sake. First, uh, let me go ahead and start with Ozeki's brand name origin. Ozeki's brand name, Ozeki, originates in the sumo world. In order to become a great sumo wrestler, you need strenuous hard work and technical skills. These are the same qualities and beliefs necessary to craft perfect, balanced, and delicious sake. Now, the top ranking sumo wrestler is given the title Yokozuna. The second rank is given the title Ozeki. As Yokozuna, you're already at the top and there's nowhere else to go. But as Ozeki, there's always room to grow and we're always striving to move forward and improve the sake and company. So that is our pioneering spirit that we take pride on. So we have two breweries. Uh, our first brewery is in, uh, was established in 1711 in Hyogo, Japan, over 300 years ago. Now, 300 years is a very long time. There's not that many companies that have been around that long. And to put it into perspective, Independence Day in the United States was in 1776. That's 65 years after Ozeki Japan was established. So there's a lot of history within our brewery. And also our brewery is in Hyogo, Japan. Hyogo is the mecca of all sake breweries in Japan. Over a third of all sakes are brewed here due to the fine water known as Miyamizu. And Miyamizu means heavenly water. And this Miyamizu makes it a very popular region for sake breweries. 
And here's some photos from Ozuki, Japan. The top left is our brewery. The bottom photo is the Miyamizu well, where we get our water for sake. So the photo on the right is our research building. I, I was lucky to actually visit it last uh, couple of years ago. This is where we research different flavors and conduct studies on how sake can actually be good for the body and also the skin. And fun fact, sake has been known to be great for the skin and is actually an ingredient for many cosmetics and face masks. And here are some behind the scenes photos from our breweries. And on the top left, top right, they are soaking the rice in water. And on the left, they are mixing the fermenting sake on the left and checking the batch on the bottom. And here is our second brewery. It's, it's in, our second brewery is in California. And in the mid 1900s, there were more and more Japanese foods and restaurants that were becoming popular in the US. Sake was also becoming very popular. And Americans wanted the taste of fresh sake, but up until then, all sake was being shipped from Japan all the way to the US, and it took several months to get here. And sake, unlike wine, is actually better fresh and not aged. So we wanted to, we wanted to make the product available in the US for Americans to taste fresh, real sake. And so in 1979, over 40 years ago, we established our second brewery in Hollister, California. It's actually very close to the Japanese American Museum, as you just saw. It's about an hour away. And we are also the first and oldest sake brewery in the United States. So we chose Hollister as, as it had the best locally grown rice and also fine water from the Sierra Nevada mountains. It's very similar to the Mia Museum in Japan. And rice and water, these are two very main ingredients for sake, and we made sure to have the best kind. So here's some photos from our Hollister Brewery as well. Uh, there's a, the photo on the left is the beautiful Hollister. And on the right are photos of our toji or brewmasters in Hollister. They are carefully preparing the rice here with koji mold, which converts the rice to sugar. And more on that in a bit. And here's some photos of our Hollister Brewery as well, mixing the sake on the top left research and development on the bottom left and some of our sake tanks on the right. And here's some photos of the labeling and bottling on the left and some of our crew drinking on the job on the right. Well, just kidding, but not really. Uh, they do need to taste to make sure that the sake is exactly right. And so what is sake? So there are four main ingredients in sake. And as I just mentioned, they are rice, water, and also koji mold. This is what turns the starch, which is the rice, into sugar. And lastly, yeast, which is what turns the sugar into alcohol. And it's pretty simple. So before we brew sake, the first, the, the first thing that we do is we polish the rice. So the outer part of the rice contains proteins and fats. The center part of the rice contains starch. There's different degrees on how much the rice is polished. This determines the classification of the sake and how it tastes. For example, when the rice is polished so that 80, 80 to 60% of the rice is remaining, this creates a more cereal grain and, and earthy flavors. And, the rice, and when the rice is polished even more so that it's 55% or less of the rice remaining, it creates a more fr fruity and floral taste. And these different polishing ratios basically create different flavors. And I will talk about that, um, about the classifications more in a bit. Here's a quick look at made. First, like I mentioned, the rice is polished. Then it is washed and soaked in water. And after that, it is steamed, cooled, and koji mold is added to some of the rice. This koji mold is what starts to change the starch into sugar. Then we create a batch called shubo where the rice and the rice with the koji mold and the yeast is added. And the yeast was, is what changes the sugar into alcohol. So these two things happen at the same time. The koji mold changes the rice into sugar while the yeast is taking that sugar and converting that to alcohol. Then this small batch, batch moves into a bigger batch adding more rice, koji and yeast. Then finally the sake is pressed, filtered, pasteurized, 
stored, pasteurized, and bottled. And so this is a general concept on how all sake is made. Mm, types of sake. So now moving on to the different types or categories of sake. And as I mentioned earlier, the sake is classified based on how much the rice is polished. It's also categorized by its ingredients. The main ingredients are rice, water, koji mold, and yeast. However, a very small amount of distilled alcohol, also known as brewer's alcohol, is sometimes added for different flavors and aromas. So looking at this chart, a sake classified as Junmai was brewed with rice that was polished to 70% of the rice remaining and only uses the four main ingredients. If distilled alcohol was added, then it would become a honjozo. The Junmai and honjozo are both generally more earthy and have a rice and grain type of flavors. Now, if the rice is polished to 60% of the rice remaining, it's called Junmai Ginjo, or just Ginjo if the distilled alcohol is added. And if the rice is polished to 50% of the rice remaining, it's called Jumai Daiginjo or Daiginjo if distilled alcohol is added. And these Ginjo and Daiginjo styles tend to have more of a fruity and floral flavor. So these six types of sake are, are the general categories, but there are other specialty sake as well. And one is called the Nigori sake, also known as cloudy sake. And you may also know it as unfiltered sake, but technically it's roughly filtered sake. And these nigori sakes can be any of the six general classifications. However, the sake has been roughly filtered with a bigger mesh so that there are some rice sediments remaining in the bottle. So we actually have some of that for you to try today. So SMV and acidity. So if you'd like, you can actually take a photo or a screenshot of this chart. This chart can help you pick sake based on your preference. So SMV is sake meter value. There's a sake meter value on every sake, usually on the back label of every bottle. So this indicates whether a sake is going to be sweet or dry. And a positive number indicates that a sake is dry. The higher the positive number, the drier the sake becomes. A negative number indicates that a sake will be sweet. And the lower the negative number, the sweeter the sake becomes. And now acidity is also usually listed on the back of the bottle. The acidity number ranges usually from one to two, but can go higher and indicates whether the sake is rich or light. The higher the number, the richer the sake, and the lower the number, the lighter the sake it becomes. And serving temperatures. And as you already may know, uh, sake can be served in different temperatures, sometimes cold, sometimes hot, or sometimes even room temperature. This is really up to your preference. However, here's some recommendations on what temperature you can drink different types of sake. And for Junmai or Honjozo type, these are earthy sakes that have been brewed with rice polished to about 70%. These can be enjoyed cold, room temperature, and hot. Cold will be smooth and refreshing. Room temperature maintains the original flavor and warming it up can open up the aroma. And now ginjo or daiginjo styles are recommended cold. These are the fruity floral flavored sake that have been brewed with rice polished to 50%. These have delicate aromas that are best enjoyed cold. And as for nigori, the cloudy sake, it's a refreshing sake that's enjoyed cold. Again, this is up to your preference, totally up to your preference. So please enjoy the sake in the way that you like. And food pairings. So sake is actually a very versatile drink. It has a lot of umami and can actually be paired well with anything. So culturally, many think of sake only when eating sushi or Japanese food. And yes, these do go together. However, it can also pair very well with all kinds of foods. Um, not just Japanese food, like for example, steak or like wings or oysters or even pizza. So please try it out whenever you can. And sake cups. So you can enjoy sake in any kind of cup. This is called a masu cup. It's usually used for celebrations. Sometimes they have it at fancy restaurants and it's very festive. This is an ochoko and tokuri. 
These are ceramic cups and are usually used for hot sake. And these I'm sure you've seen before as well. These are for cold sake. And all of these are very common cups to use for sake. However, you can actually enjoy sake in wine glasses as well. Personally, I prefer drinking sake in wine glasses myself because for one, you can definitely pour more and the shape of the glass helps to catch the aromas and taste so that you can really experience the flavors. And on to our sake tasting. Yes, so this is the part that I think all of you are really excited about, and I personally am too. So please have your bottles ready, as well as five cups as we'll be tasting different, different things, and as well your snacks as well. So as the sun, please take it away. Thank you. Okay, so the first one we will be trying today is the dry, the Ozeki Sake dry. So you guys have your bottles, and I'm going to go ahead and pour along with you guys. And I have my wine glass. As I mentioned, I definitely like the wine glass more because you can definitely pour more and it really, you can really smell and taste it a lot better with this. So ready guys, are you, I don't know, are you guys, if you guys poured it and ready? Yes, I think we're all ready. <laughs> ready, let's cheers. Hi, <laughs> come bye. Come bye. <laughs> So this is um, one of the original sakes that Ozaki first brewed in California in 1979. It is a Junmai sake. That means that the rice is polished to 70% of the rice remaining. It also only uses the four main ingredients and does not have any distilled alcohol added. And the SMV is plus eight, which means it's very dry. And the acidity is 1.3, which means it is light. So this is a very extra dry, smooth, light-bodied sake. It's also very earthy. If you could go ahead and smell it, you might be able to smell like how it's really earthy and you can smell the rice. Mm -hmm. And since this is a Junmai, it can be enjoyed warm, room temperature, or cold. And for food pairings, it can be enjoyed with anything, but some of you can try salads, tofu, lighter sushi, and sashimi or pork bellies, or even spicy foods. And um, even the spicy ika that you guys have with you today. How's it, how's it Yuki-san? Yes, it's actually really nice. And this one, just like Asasan mentioned, the pairing for this one is the, sorry, I'm not sure you can see because of my background, but it's the ika, the, the um, shredded squid, and it's a little bit spicy and I think it's perfect with it. So please try it together. And let us know what you think in the comments as well. Thank you. Yeah, it's really good. Um, this sake actually, it's also gluten-free, sulfite-free, kosher, wow. and non-GMO. And by the way, fun fact, all sake is actually gluten-free and sulfite-free. And all oh, sake, wow. yeah, it is, it's pretty cool. Like, I don't know if many people know that, but um, basically any sake that you can get is gluten-free, sulfite-free. And all sake that's brewed in Ozeki in America are kosher. And most of our imported ones are kosher as well. So how do you like it, Ikisa? I really like it. How, how does everybody like it? Everybody likes it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm not sure. Do you guys want to move on to the next one? Yes, let's try the next one as well. I think we are all ready. <laughs> so the next one is the Yamada Nishiki. So... This is this bottle right here. <laughs> Sometimes you have to like bring it in front of you <laughs> to oh. see because of the background. Yeah. Uh, let me go ahead and pour mine too. You ready? We can. Everyone's ready. Come by. Come by. Come by this. So this sake is brewed in Hyogo, Japan, and mm -hmm. it is a tokubetsu junmai. And tokubetsu means special. So the rice is polished to 70% and there is no distilled alcohol that's added. And this tokubetsu or this, it actually tokubetsu means special. And the reason why it's called tokubetsu is because it's made of 100% Yamada Nishiki rice. And this is a type of sake rice 
that is known as the king of the king of sake rice. And it's a premium grade rice that makes one of the best sake and flavors. So the sake meter value for this is plus three, which means it's dry, but not super dry. And the acidity is 1.6, so it's more on the rich side. So if you can smell it, I don't know if you can smell this. I think it's pretty um, clear that this is a very rich rice board, meaning you can really smell and taste the rice and full body and has a dry finish. And since this is a Junmai, you can actually enjoy this warm, room temperature or cold. And for food pairings, it can be paired very well with a variety of sushi, uh, teriyaki chicken, fried chicken, miso salmon, beef stroganoff, and the baby star ramen that you guys have today. Yes. Uh, how's it? How's it? Everybody? It's perfect. So Shohei-san says definitely noticeably more fuller and less dry than the super dry, the, the previous one. Yes. And indeed, I think I agree with that. And um, to this one, we're being paired with two items because, you know, one is never enough. So we're doing it with the baby star ramen um, tonkotsu flavor. It's the yellow one. And with the yakisoba flavor. So please try it with each one and it should be really good. So. Nice. Can you smell the rice too? I can. Yeah. It's, it's very, yeah. Like I think um, Shohei-san said, it's very full and it's has a really nice like aroma to it. Mm -hmm, it does. Yeah. This one is actually one of our popular items as well. Oh, um, yeah. This, you can actually, this is, it's a recognizable brand and you can find it at almost any Japanese grocery store. And this one was uh, imported from Japan? Yes. Yeah, so this one is imported from Japan um, because this one is made in our Ozaki Japan brewery in Hyogo. And oh. like um, some, some of our sake that we have in the U.S. are, you know, some from Hollister and some are imported from Japan as well. I see. I see. So you get to take those. Yes. <laughs> so this sake is also gluten-free sulfite-free, kosher, non-GMO, and also vegan-friendly as well. Let me drink up. <laughs> so next, we will be moving on to the platinum. I'm excited for this one. <laughs> yeah. This is actually one of my favorites. Oh, is it? <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> so this one is brewed in Hollister in our California brewery. Let's go ahead and pour it in our glasses. Ready? Yes. Okay, come by again. <laughs> come by. Bye. Bye this. So again, this is brewed in Hollister and it is a Junmai Daiginjo. So you can go ahead and smell this. Like you, you can, if you have a wine glass, you can go like this and swirl it around and then smell it. But it tastes, uh, you can really smell the fruity and floralness of the flavors. So this SMV is negative two. Uh, negative two, which means it's on the sweet side, but it's not too sweet, um, mm. but it's basically not dry. And the acidity is 1.6. So it's on the rich side. And so this sake is floral, fruity, and smooth. And if you actually compare it back to back with the Yamada Nishiki, that, the one that we just had, you can really tell the difference of how a Junmai is more earthy and rice-like, while this Daiginjo is more fruity and floral. Can you tell the difference, Yuki-san? Yeah, the, the kaori, the aroma is just so wonderful to smell. Yeah, I, I personally like this a lot. I definitely want to get a wine glass next time. <laughs> I need to grab them. <laughs> Any of you guys start grabbing your wine glasses out of the cabinets? <laughs> I mean, you can definitely pour more. You don't need to keep yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that tip. <laughs> <laughs> so again, well, for food pairings, you know, this one, some recommendations are, you know, full flavored sushi, like mackerel or smoked salmon or sushi rolls, like Philadelphia rolls, perhaps. And tofu, salads, seared scallop, and salted mushrooms. And I think you guys have soy jerky with you guys. Yes, we have the soy jerky for this one. So please try it with this. And I must say, all the food pairings that you're listing is making me really hungry. But I think <laughs> soy jerky will hopefully tie you over until dinner. 
<laughs> Please try it together, guys. Let us know what you think in the comments as well. We'd love to hear from you. Mm, yeah, it's good. <laughs> so oh, this, this wonderful. yeah. Which one is your favorite so far? Oh my gosh, for sure this one. <laughs> for this one? Yeah, this I love one. this one. <laughs> <laughs> so this socket is gluten-free, sulfide-free, kosher, and non-GMO as well. Actually, um, a lot of our socket that we make in Hollister is non-GMO. Um, there are a lot of there are several other breweries in the U.S., but um, all of our socket here is non-GMO. Uh, not not to talk bad about other breweries, but only ours is mostly all non-GMO. That's just a fun fact. So, and moving on, let's try the nigori sake. So nigori sake will be this one. So ready, make sure before you before you pour this one, make sure that you, you shake it really well because okay. there's actually rice sediments that fall to the bottom of the bottle. Oh, I see. And oh, definitely you might want to get like a different glass for this too. So it's very milky, a milky look. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Oh, I think you already started, but come by. <laughs> come by this. So this is actually brewed in Hollister, California as well. Um, it's a cloudy sake. Uh, the rice for this was polished to 70% and then roughly filtered so that some of the rice sediments are remaining in the bottle. And so that's why you have to actually make sure to shake this bottle very well. Anytime you have a new boy, you want to shake the bottle. Um, before drinking it. And the sake meter value for this is negative 30, which means it's very sweet, as you can tell. And you can tell it's pretty sweet, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the acidity is 1.8, meaning it's very rich. So it's a very creamy, rich, and sweet sake, and it's best enjoyed cold. Usually anytime you have a nigori, it's, um, I, I've heard of a couple people who like to heat it up, but generally it's recommended to drink cold because it's refreshing. Excellent. And also, yeah. <laughs> and fun fact, uh, sweet nigori sakes like this are extremely popular in the US market, but not so much in Japan. In Japan, drier sakes tend to be more popular than sweet. And as, as for food pairings, we recommend anything sweet as this nigori is very sweet, you usually want to pair something that's sweet with a sweet tasting food as well, so it doesn't overpower it. You can actually pair it with spicy foods as well. So yeah, how do you like it with your chitara? Yes, so with this one, we're gonna be eating the chitara. If you see this one, the packaging here, um, it is, I think like cheese with like um, tara, which is a type of fish thin slices of fish around it. It's one of my favorites actually. So <laughs> it's great, but I love this one. It's very creamy, like you mentioned. Yes. And yes. Uh, very smooth too. I actually really like this one. Yeah, some people think compared to like a pina colada, it's mm. actually a really good base for cocktails as well. So you can use this as a base and add whatever you like with it. Um, I actually have something else for you next, which is kind of similar in that way. But it's it's very good. It's very popular in the U.S. market. Um, it's also a very good gateway sake. So, like, if somebody who doesn't even drink sake normally, usually this is something that most people will like. Um, it's not too like it's not too much of an alcohol flavor, like you know, like regular sake. So, you know, for me personally, I started off with this nigori as well. I used to buy this every day um, for like a <laughs> for like you know a couple months and drinking this all the time. Um, when I first started drinking sake like 20 years ago. So that's awesome. Wow. So it's like a nice beginner friendly one. It's definitely beginner friendly. Um, I mean, what it's 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 easy for anyone to drink, but you know, even once once you start drinking the other sake too that are that that aren't as sweet, you know, you can always go back to this and just change it up sometimes. Okay, that's wonderful. So moving on to the nigori strawberry. So it's that so is sweet. this one, yeah, on this shelf right here. Yeah, and it's, it's a really cute pink bottle that we have. So you wanna make sure to shake this up as well because there's rice sediments in here. Mm -hmm. So 
the color is, you know, pinkish reddish. Um, here you go. It's a pretty color. But yeah, cheers. it's beautiful. Come by. Hi, come by this. Come by. So this is the last one we're tasting. Um, it's brewed in Hollister as well. And it is a cloudy sake. And this sake actually uses the same nigori, this one. It's actually using this one as the base. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the rice is polished to 70% and then roughly filtered so that some of the rice sediments are remaining. However, with this one, um, real California grown strawberries are combined into this, um, the previous nigori that we tried. And the second meter value for this is negative 70, which means it's extremely sweet. And the acidity is four, which means it's extremely rich. And so this is a, yeah, so this, this is a very creamy, rich and sweet sake, kind of like the other one, but it, it, with the strawberry flavors and it can be paired very well with other, you know, sweet things like desserts and fruits and obviously enjoyed cold uh, since it's a nigori. So how do you like this one? It's delicious. I love this. It's almost kind of like, um, like a dessert sort of alternative as well. But for this one, we're also pairing it with the um, cookies from JT Express. So this is from a local Japantown business um, and it's matcha cookies. And so please try it with it. It's delicious. These cookies are great too with it. And uh, Shohei-san says, great alternative to yogurt for breakfast. <laughs> what a great way to begin your day, Shohei-san. Oh yeah, <laughs> it is a great alternative, yes. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this packet, I mean, with this one, you can make cocktails as well, um, you know, but you can drink it as is. It's already kind of like an already made cocktail and it's great. You can have it as a dessert, like you said, um, and you'll eat it with different fruits. And this sake was actually released two years ago and it's a very, very, very popular item. And it's been picked up at Asian grocery stores and restaurants all over very quickly. And you can find this and in fact, all of these, um, all of these sakes that we tried today, these um, are available at almost any Japanese grocery stores like Mitsua, Marukai, Tokyo Central, Sewa Market, and Nijia. And not limited to those, there's other, you know, other Asian grocery stores do have some of these items as well. So if you have a, you know, a grocery store near you, you can always go there and, you know, check it out and try different, try different, uh, uh, is that what they have there well so, this is delicious and that color yeah. is so pretty and everything wow so everything is there's no artificial flavors in this so it's also gluten-free sulfite-free kosher and non-gmo see yeah. yes please in the comments everybody now that you've tried all of them please let us know what your favorite was and we'd love to hear yes i we definitely would love to hear that um, and before I go, actually, I'd like to share some special news for you. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, um, at Ozeki, we have the pioneering. Oh, sorry, that's our strawberry right there. <laughs> <laughs> How could we forget? <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> but moving on. So the, the pioneering spirit, um, this is at, at, for at Ozeki, we have the pioneering spirit, the spirit where we are always striving to learn and move forward and become pioneers for the sake industry. And with that said, we're very happy to announce that we are the world's first sake brewery to celebrate diversity with these rainbow one cup and rainbow dry sake. Oh my gosh, I love this. Yay. Wow, this is yeah. great. This is definitely very colorful. And um, well, so sake breweries like us are very old. They're, we're a very old company, over 300 years old. And there's a lot of history and tradition, but also tends to be very conservative. So this is actually a very monumental feat for us to be the first to recognize and celebrate diversity. And for one, I for one, actually, I'm very proud to be part of this amazing inclusive company myself. As and you should be. This is an incredible initiative. And when can we start seeing this in the stores? Actually, so this is will be rolling out sometime in March and oh, okay. throughout to to June. Yeah, enough um ready for Pride Month. So of course, you know, that's great. 
<laughs> yeah, you can actually find these at Japanese grocery stores too. And some restaurants will be carrying these as well. So you can, maybe you'll see these around when you're shopping or, you know, dining at some Japanese restaurants or other restaurants as well that may have these. Well, I will definitely be looking out for these because these are amazing. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. And thank you guys so much. Yeah, that's that's all for it for me today. But thank you, Yuki-san. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And thanks for tasting it with me. Thank you so much, but not so soon because we are moving on to the Q&A section. So for the audience members here, if you have any questions for Elsa-san or Mark-san, um, we will be happy to take any questions from you. And please just drop it into the chat or raise your hand and we'll definitely got call on you to ask your questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free. In the meantime, I'm going to be asking you a question first, if that's okay. Um, I'm wondering, is the process the same as in Japan? Yes, it is. Um, we actually, so you know how our sake breweries have been around for like over 300 years yes. and the tradition and the expertise that, you know, we use and the methods that we make, we use to make sake have been passed down for generations and generations. And we take that and we continue to use the same methods and expertise. However, as Ozeki, as I mentioned, we are very, we are pioneers, always striving to move forward and learn and make different kinds of sake. So we it's a combination of both, but we definitely use the same process in Japan and in the US. And also our toji, which are brewmasters, um, are actually from Japan. The one they actually come from Japan to Hollister, and they bring the methods from Japan over to Hollister, and we make the same sake in Hollister as we do in Japan. Wow, that's amazing! Thank you so much. And actually, just for the audience, um, I wanted to reintroduce Mark again. Sorry, one more time. And um, Mark is a um, sales and marketing manager at Ozeki. He's been there for nine years as well. So we're really happy to have both of you here to ask um, and to answer all our questions. <laughs> so please do let us know, audience members, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to ask them for you. And I, so, sorry, one second. <laughs> Does the Ozeki Hollister location offer tours? Yes, normally it, they do, but currently during the pandemic and the COVID situation, we are not. Um, but please, you know, once things get better, you know, we do have a brewery and a tasting room that, you know, will be open to the public. And hopefully, since you guys are close, I'm assuming you guys are all close, you know, you guys can come and visit and take a tour with us. That's wonderful. Um, I see a hand from Nancy. Nancy, would you like to unmute yourself? Oh, how do you do that? It's unmuted. Oh, you're, oh you're unmuted. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my Welcome question is, mm -hmm. um, is why did you pick Hollister? Because we see rice fields around Sacramento and such, and I don't know of any big rivers that offer a lot of water to raise rice around Hollister. So actually, um, we do, yeah, so we use Sacramento rice. And we have a rice, there is a rice field close to Hollister um, that creates um, the sake rice that we use. It's called cow roast rice. And we actually use that. It's probably like, I'm not sure, maybe like an hour away from Hollister where we um, can get where the crops are grown. And also we use water from the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, but yeah, Mark, did you want to add anything to that or? When we um, opened at the brewery, uh, the sake um, business wasn't that big. So and we have to combine with the wine. So that the Hollister, Gilroy, the area is the uh, between, um, that's a kind of, uh, you know, shipping road of the wine from Napa. So people can pick up the sake and then going down to San Diego, San Francisco, Los Angeles, or something like that. So, and Hollister is a great location for the, uh, you know, like a productive reason and then uh, shipping reason. So that's why, yeah. Okay. Well, I can tell you that once you reopen tours, if we have people coming in from out of town, instead of taking a wine tasting, we'll take them sake tasting. Yay. Perfect idea. Yes, Nancy. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And again, if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to raise your hand or to put it into the chat. Um, Joe, is that a hand? Sorry, I think I I see you, Joe. Go, go ahead, Joe. 
Yes, <clears throat> I was very interested in the quality of the water that you described from the Hyogo uh, area. And I guess that minerals from different plains kind of combine in some special ways. How does that water compare to areas like Niigata? I, Niigata water uh, is that like a northern Japan has a more soft water. It's much softer, so uh, it's less mineral. So and then Western Japan uh, has a really um, hard water. So uh, it, anything with hard water, it's actually Sierra Nevada water is really hard too. So anything with the hard water uh, becoming um, like a dry finished sake. So and in the northern Japan, Niigata, um, Iwate, those kind of area, usually, usually probably ninety percent or more, their sake is really softer. It's like a slightly uh, fruity, slightly soft, slightly slightly sweet. So, but uh, you know, um, U.S. sake uh, as and Takara and then Ageke Kan, whatever in the US from the uh, United States, uh, that's really hard. It's dry because of the water. But, uh, you know, um, we actually use softener twice, <laughs> but still it really dry. So, and then I, I'm very sure other um, breweries are using softener as well. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you. And another question this is one that I'm interested in as well. What cocktails can be made with the sake? Cocktails. Well, uh, the popular <laughs> one is like, a, you know, like a sake bomb, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, sake, mm, the alcohol wise is like a usually 15% around. Right. So it's still um, strong enough if you want to mix with something else. So uh, sometimes it's a, a citrus uh, based juice. It's usually uh, good, like orange or pineapple or you know lemon, um, but uh, um, it depends how much you've drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of the things that I do is, um, it, I'm sure you guys are familiar with karupiko. Yes. So, yeah, you can actually even like the karupiko concentrate. The concentrate personally, I think is better. So it won't dilute the alcohol too much if you like the alcohol like I do. Um, but yeah, you can actually get a karupiko concentrate and put a little bit in the sake and add some ice. Um, some other things that you can do is, you know, you can kind of like make a lemon drop, um, you know, martini with the sake. So make it like a sake tini. Um, and also, you know, maybe like mango juice, something like, you know, Mark just said, but you can do like a mango juice. Um, personally, I would do like a little bit of dash so that it doesn't overpower and just become like just juice. Um, and those are some different things. You can get completely creative with that. There's no wrong way to make a cocktail. Technically, you can actually do whatever that you want. And if it tastes good, that's a good cocktail. So. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. I'll definitely be running to a, a supermarket after this and trying some different cocktails. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the next question is in Japan, they use wood for the brewing vats. And does Hollister also use wood as well? You mean like the casts, right? I think so. I think that's, yeah, that they're talking about. Or yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we actually do have several sake. That's, it's called, we have one actually in the U.S. called Taruzake that we import from Japan. And this, um, if you do have a chance to taste it, it is available in some stores. It's not wi as widely um, known, but this is something that if you actually smell it and taste it, you can. It smells like these wood cedar casks. So this is like a um, a master cup actually, but mm -hmm. these really smell like the wood. Um, it, it smells like wood, like a cedar wood. And so the sake that we brew in these actually smell just like this. And so they are available. Um, you just have to find it. And <laughs> I think it should be, in, you can check some grocery stores, but I can't guarantee that they're in all of them. Um, it's, it might be a little bit hard to find, but they are out there. Wonderful. And um, are there any special seasonal sakes done at Ozeki? Well, we don't really, oh, go ahead, fukushima <laughs> Uh, in the United States, we don't really have those, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, usually uh, uh, depends on the harvest season, uh, we do, we did have a special uh, fresh brewed sake, but um, 
um, we really don't have those nowadays. Yeah, I see. And um, one, sorry, one last question because we have to move on. But um, once you open the bottle, how long is the sake good for? I think all of us are wondering that right now because we just opened five and I don't know if we can all finish it tonight. So actually, um, technically, they don't really go bad as easily as wine or, you know, other, you know, items, other, other alcoholic beverages. Um, technically, we say like two weeks, but honestly, with this, like this, this, you know how I used to drink this all the time. Technically, if you put it in the refrigerator for like two months, it's totally fine. Three months, it's totally fine. Um, <laughs> the only thing is, you know, maybe after a very, very long time, like one year later, you can tell the difference. Um, once it's open, though, you might, you know, it will start changing a little bit more faster. But I would say, personally, if you keep it in the refrigerator, it does last longer or it does keep the quality longer. And I would say maybe like if you open it, maybe a couple months, but even after that, you can go ahead and try it. The only difference is the taste kind of starts to change a tiny bit, like after a long time. And the best way to store sake actually is out of the sun and in the refrigerator. That's the best way for it to, you know, you can keep sake for a very long time in that case. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So everybody, hopefully you make note of that and you're putting it into the fridge or you can have a party tonight. There's Super Bowl tomorrow anyway. So yes. please enjoy. <laughs> so before we move on, I would love to get a group shot if possible. So here I'm going to ask everybody if you're comfortable to turn on your camera and get your glass is ready with your sake and we're going to do a group kanpai and so if you can all actually click on gallery view it's on your right hand side and it should say view and if you click on gallery you can see everybody can you do that everybody can see each other now perfect all right so we're going to do kanpai so kanpai 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 Thank you so much, everybody. And but don't turn off yet because we do have some exciting things still left over. Um, and we will be moving on to the raffle. So all of you here are automatically entered into a raffle tonight. So in order to win the prize, you do need to stay on. So please stay on <laughs> because we need to get your contact information to be able to give you the raffle prizes. And before we do that, I wanted to show you a promotional video from Takara Sake, who is donating uh, for part of this raffle as well. Tradition gives a culture depth and richness. It endures through generations and across oceans. From its home in Berkeley, California, overlooking San Francisco Bay, Takara Sake USA carries on an ancient sake making legacy. The Takara story goes back 170 years to Fushimi, Kyoto, home of many of Japan's oldest sake makers. Our founder, Unosuke, the fourth descendant of the House of Yomo, joined them in 1842. The family business grew, and in 1897, the Takara name was trademarked. Operations and sales grew steadily. Takara Sake USA is committed to spreading awareness about sake. The public is welcome at the Sake Museum inside the Berkeley headquarters, where 10,000 visitors a year see ancient sake making tools and learn ancient brewing methods from Fushimi, Kyoto. And there is a tasting room where they can enjoy a selection of our products. As with wine, there is a sake that goes best with seafood, steak, or your favorite vegetables, and a sake to fit the season. Chefs pair sake not only with Japanese food, but also with other world cuisines such as French and Italian, and the fusion cuisines that combined international dishes with elements of Japanese cuisine. Crafted from the bounty of nature. Sake makes life richer and more fulfilling. So let us share a toast to sake. Kampai. And may your glasses be forever filled with the best of nature. Yes, thank you so much to Ozeki Sake, who, who has donated six casks, as well as Takara Sake, who has donated 
two casks for this raffle. Now, as I mentioned, everybody here is entered in, so we're going to be starting right away. So the first prize is going to be the Ozeki Komotaru cask, which is 1.5 liters. So please, can we start the, the wheel? And whoever it's going to, whoever it lands on, please do the raise hand function on Zoom if you can, just so that we can confirm that you're here. Congratulations, Alyssa! Alyssa! Alyssa here. So Thank that you. is yes, congratulations to all eight winners tonight. And to those who won, please do stick around after this event you because betcha. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. <laughs> because we do need to get your contact information in order to give you <laughs> give you the sake. Um, and to also take a Zoom photo. Now we want to take this moment to thank everybody here as well as thank you to Ozeki Sake, Kozue san, Asa san, Mark san. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and for sharing your wealth of knowledge and all about sake. I think we've learned so much throughout this event. Thanks to the Consul General Kawamura sama and his team from the Consul General, Horigome san and Suzuki san, for the great support of this event. And to Takara Sake. And of course, we can't forget the San Jose Japantown businesses. Now, please, please, please do support your local Japantown businesses. You know, that's part of like our, our drive and our passion to really support our local businesses. So please do visit if you can. And thank you to the Jams SJ volunteers, Linda, Miranda, and Chris. You guys were wonderful as always. And last but certainly not least, thank you to everybody here for participating and for your great support of the Kawakami House Restoration Project. Also, please don't forget that on your bags that you received, you should have received the two for one ticket. Um, it allows you to come back to the museum once it opens and you can bring somebody else with you. Now, the museum is celebrating the 35th anniversary this year and we do have plans to reopen on March 3rd. So we hope to see you all there. Everyone, Please be careful when you stand up again um, and please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much and see you again soon. Thank Yuki, you. Yuki, thank you very much. Yay, Yuki. <laughs> thank you.